Hello, this is Dr. Oviedo. Today we are going to discuss pathology of the oral cavity, salivary glands, and nasal lesions. The oral cavity is lined by stratified squamous epithelium. Here you can see the tongue on the right is lined by keratinizing stratified squamous epithelium. This is a layered epithelium and the cells flatten as they reach the surface and keratinize. You can tell it's keratinized because it is a darker pink than the epithelium below it. The buccal mucosa and the gingiva are composed of non-keratinizing stratified squamous epithelium. This is a layered epithelium and the cells flatten as they reach the surface. They do not turn pink as they reach the surface. That means they are non-keratinizing. Please note the normal histology of the tongue and buccal mucosa is reviewed in a separate video. Let's go on to oral squamous cell carcinoma. Oral lesions include erythroplakia, mass, or ulcer. They can be painful or painless. Sometimes oral squamous cell carcinoma can present as a neck mass. For example, a lymph node metastasis can be present at presentation. Some patients will have weight loss. Oral squamous cell carcinoma has two major types, classic and HPV associated. Classic is a carcinogen induced carcinoma. It is associated with tobacco and alcohol use. The locations are ventral surface of the tongue, floor of the mouth, lower lip, soft palate, and gingiva. 70% of oral squamous cell carcinomas are associated with oncogenic human papilloma virus, usually HPV-16. These are usually located on the tonsils, base of tongue, or pharynx. HPV-associated oral squamous cell carcinoma has a better prognosis than classic tobacco and alcohol-associated oral squamous cell carcinoma. Please note that other common sites for squamous cell carcinoma are the cervix, skin, lung, esophagus, and anus. Let's take a look at the progression from normal squamous epithelium to squamous dysplasia to squamous cell carcinoma. Here you have a drawing of the squamous epithelium. You can see there is an orderly maturation. Maturation means the cells are more plump at the bottom and flatten out as they approach the surface. The keratinization is shown on this drawing as pink cells. Squamous dysplasia means you have more of a disordered maturation and a jumbled look. Here on the right, I've shown a squamous cell carcinoma. You can see there is no maturation and there is completely disordered growth. This is an invasive tumor and there is keratinization in all areas, not just at the surface. Here we have a tongue with a squamous cell carcinoma. Here is our biopsy. Here on the right, you can see the squamous cell carcinoma. Let's discuss genetic alterations. For classic oral squamous cell carcinoma and HPV-associated oral squamous cell carcinoma. The classic form has P53 mutation, P63 mutation, and NOTCH1 mutation. P53 is commonly involved in many cancer pathways. P63 and NOTCH1 are involved in squamous differentiation. HPV-associated oral squamous cell carcinoma has P16 overexpression, P53 inactivation, and retinoblastoma pathway inactivation. P16 is a cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor. P53 and RB are commonly involved in many cancer pathways. Please note that this is a vast oversimplification of a fairly complex topic. Let's go on to discuss leukoplakia and erythroplakia. Leuko, of course, means white, so leukoplakia is a white lesion that may represent a benign hyperkeratosis. Hyperkeratosis means there is a thicker keratinized layer, or it may be a precancerous lesion. 5 to 25% of leukoplakia lesions are pre-malignant. Erythroplakia, of course, is a red lesion because erythro means red. This usually represents carcinoma in situ. Up to 90% of erythroplakia lesions can be carcinoma in situ. Here I have a photograph of leukoplakia. You can see the white lesion on the ventral surface of the tongue. And here on the right is erythroplakia. You can see the red lesion on the soft palate. The prognosis of oral squamous cell carcinoma is dependent on location and stage. Patients with low stage have a 65 to 75% five-year survival. Metastatic disease means there is a 35% five-year survival. 
HPV-associated cancer has a better prognosis than classic tobacco alcohol-associated oral cancer. Let's go on to the salivary gland. This is the parotid gland, this is the sublingual gland, and this is the submandibular gland. This is simply to remind you of the locations of the large salivary glands. There are minor salivary glands present throughout the oral mucosa. This is important to know because the minor salivary glands are much easier to biopsy than the large salivary glands, of course. This is a review of the parotid gland. Here's our histology. You can see there are excretory ducts. In addition, you should be able to find striated ducts, an acinus, and a myoepithelial cell. Please note the parotid gland is reviewed in a separate video. Let's go on to Sjogren's syndrome. Sjogren's syndrome refers to an autoimmune disease with dry mouth and dry eyes. This is most common in women, generally in the age 50 to 60 years old. These patients can have xerostomia, which means dry mouth. This can present with difficulty swallowing, decreased taste, and cracks and fissures in the mouth. Keratoconjunctivitis cica, which means dry eyes, can present with blurring of vision, burning, or itching. These patients will have parotid gland enlargement secondary to inflammation. However, it does involve all of the major and minor salivary glands. Let's take a look at the pathology. Here you can see a biopsy of a salivary gland with Sjogren's syndrome. You can see there are large numbers of lymphocytes attacking the acinar cells. The inflammation will cause acinar cell death and the tissues will no longer produce saliva. Normal salivary gland has very few inflammatory cells. This inflammation will also affect lacrimal glands and minor salivary glands. This is important because the minor salivary glands of the lower lip are very amenable to biopsy for diagnostic purposes. Let's discuss the pathogenesis. Sjogren's syndrome is autoimmune destruction of lacrimal and salivary glands. 90% of patients will have Rho and La antibodies. The pathogenesis is aberrant T and B cell activation against salivary gland tissue in genetically susceptible patients. Associations include rheumatoid arthritis, synovitis, diffuse pulmonary fibrosis, and peripheral neuropathy. Therapy is generally supportive. Prognosis is that this is a slowly progressive disease that can evolve over decades with a waxing and waning clinical course. Approximately 5% of patients will develop a lymphoma secondary to chronic B-cell activation. Let's discuss the pathogenesis. Here I have a drawing of a salivary gland acinus. When there are environmental triggers such as viruses, stress, or hormonal factors, you can get initiation and perpetuation of aberrant immune responses. I've shown that here as a T cell and a B cell on top of the salivary gland cell. This of course is what it would look like under the microscope. These reactions will cause apoptosis which will result in a destruction of the gland. You can get autoantibodies which cause secretory dysfunction. You can get immune complexes which will cause a peripheral neuropathy. And in the serum you can have Rho and La antibodies which are disease markers. And here on the right, I've shown MALT lymphoma. MALT is mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. This is of course a B cell lymphoma. Let's go on to discuss mucosal of minor salivary gland. Here is a gross picture. You can see the lesion on the lower lip. This is a very common location for mucosal. Here is the whole mount. Blockage of a minor salivary gland duct can cause leakage of saliva into surrounding tissues, which causes an inflammatory response. On high power, you can see that there is mucin and inflammatory cells in the cyst. Let's go on to salivary gland tumors. Pleomorphic adenoma is a benign tumor that shows epithelial, myoepithelial, and mesenchymal tissues. 
The most common location is the parotid gland. There is a wide age range with one peak in childhood and another peak in the fourth through sixth decade. Pleomorphic adenoma has PLAG1 gene rearrangements. PLAG1 is a transcription factor that upregulates expression of genes involved in cell growth. Let's take a look at the pathology. Here we have a gross picture which shows our very sharply demarcated pleomorphic adenoma. Here is the whole mount. You can see there is some normal parotid on the right. At high power, the tumor is composed of epithelial cells, myoepithelial cells with a myxoid background, and chondroid cells. Let's go on to Worthen tumor. This is also known as papillary cystadenoma lymphomatosum. This is a benign tumor composed of a double layer of oncocytic epithelioid cells forming papillary and cystic structures and resting on a reactive lymphoid stroma. This occurs largely in the parotid gland. The risk factors are smoking. 10% of these are bilateral and 10% are multifocal. Multiple tumors may be synchronous or metachronous. Synchronous means the tumors occur at the same time. Metachronous means the tumors occur at different points in time. Oncocytic is a word we use to describe a finely granular eosinophilic cytoplasm due to large amounts of mitochondria. Let's take a look at the pathology. Here is our tumor. You can see it's surrounded by normal parotid gland. Here is our tumor, and here you can see at mid-power the papillary pattern. Here on the right, you can see the double-layered oncocytic epithelium overlying the lymphoid stroma. Here is the double-layered oncocytic epithelium. And here, of course, are the lymphocytes. Let's go on to mucoepidermoid carcinoma. This is a malignant tumor composed of squamous cells and mucus-secreting cells forming solid and cystic patterns. It occurs in both major and minor salivary glands. Approximately half of these tumors are associated with a 1119 translocation, which creates a MECT1 MAML2 fusion. The prognosis depends on the histologic grade of the tumor. Let's take a look at the pathology. Here is our tumor. Mid power demonstrates the cystic and solid patterns. Here on the right, you can see a high power demonstrating a mucin secreting cell along with multiple squamous cells. This would be a good point to stop the video and attempt to write down everything you've just learned about the three salivary gland tumors we just discussed. Pleomorphic adenoma is a benign tumor composed of epithelial, myoepithelial, and mesenchymal tissues. Worthen tumor is a benign tumor composed of a double layer of epithelioid cells resting on reactive lymphoid stroma. Mucoepidermoid carcinoma is a malignant tumor composed of squamous cells and mucus secreting cells. Let's go on to nasal lesions. Nasopharyngeal carcinoma is a malignant tumor associated with Epstein-Barr virus infection. EBV is a herpes virus. It is a DNA virus. Nasopharyngeal carcinoma is also associated with high nitrosamine diet, meaning preserved meats, and with smoking and chemical fumes. The clinical presentation is that it is common in African children and southern Chinese adults. This tumor is rare in the United States. It may also present with an enlarged lymph node. There are three histologic types, keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma, non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma, and undifferentiated basaloid carcinoma. This tumor has an overall five-year survival of 60%. Let's take a look at the radiology. Here is our axial CT scan. You can see here is the nose, here is the nasal septum, this is the maxillary sinus, back here is the cerebellum, and here of course is the skull. Right here is the large mass which represents the nasopharyngeal carcinoma. I've put a blue outline around the tumor. 
Let's go on to the pathology. This tumor is composed of large epithelial cells with round to ovoid nuclei, prominent nucleoli, and moderate amounts of cytoplasm. There are synchytium-like clusters of cells. Synchytium-like means that you cannot see the cell borders very well. There are benign lymphocytes in the background. This tumor is positive for Epstein-Barr virus by in situ hybridization. Let's take a look at the pathology. Here is our tumor. You can see here are the carcinoma cells and here are the background lymphocytes. Down here, this dark bluish blackish color represents in situ hybridization, which is positive for Epstein-Barr virus. I want to discuss EBV and cancer a bit at this point. Epstein-Barr virus is most famous for causing B-cell tumors including Burkitt's lymphoma, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, Hodgkin lymphoma, and B-cell lymphoproliferative disorder. These are all highly complex mechanisms. In addition, you can also get non-B-cell tumors including nasopharyngeal carcinoma, gastric carcinoma, and T or NK lymphoma. Let's discuss in more detail how the EBV causes the nasopharyngeal carcinoma in immunocompetent patients. I've specifically said immunocompetent patients because we have previously discussed how other herpes virus, for example, Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus, can cause Kaposi sarcoma. However, that occurs in immunocompromised patients and patients with immunological defects. EBV virus present in saliva can be passed from person to person. This generally occurs in childhood or adolescence. Here I've used blue circles to represent the EBV virus. Here is a B cell and here is an EBV virus infecting the B cell. Here I've shown a B cell with latent EBV infection. That blue circle represents an EBV episome. Most people will not develop disease and simply maintain the EBV in the form of an episome. However, some patients who have additional factors such as exposure to a carcinogen can go on to develop nasopharyngeal carcinoma. This additional exposure can occur over years, and this can allow the epithelial cells to be infected by EBV. Please note that normal nasopharynx is lined by respiratory epithelium. However, I put squamous epithelium in the drawing because nasopharyngeal carcinoma is a squamous type tumor. These blue circles represent EBV infecting the epithelium. And down here, this is a nasopharyngeal carcinoma with EBV episomes in the malignant cells. This photograph represents what the tumor would look like under the microscope. Please note, this is a complex topic and this is a simplified explanation of the processes that result in nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Let's go on to nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. This is a benign, highly vascular tumor that occurs almost exclusively in adolescent males due to testosterone-dependent puberty-induced growth. The clinical presentation is epistaxis, which means nosebleed. You should avoid biopsying this tumor because there is a very high risk of excessive bleeding. Here is our radiology. This is an axial T2 MRI. Here is our nose, here is the nasal septum, here is the maxillary sinus, and here is the cerebellum. Here, of course, is the nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. I put a blue circle around the tumor. Here is the pathology. You can see there are abnormal blood vessels and fibroblasts which produce a fibrous or collagenous stroma. Let's go on to discuss nasal polyps. These are inflammatory polyps of the nasal mucosa. There are many etiologies, allergy, infection, cystic fibrosis, aspirin intolerance, and there are also familial forms. Aspirin intolerance refers to a tetrad of asthma, nasal polyps, 
chronic hypertrophic eosinophilic sinusitis and aspirin intolerance. This is, of course, a complex subject. We are simply mentioning it because nasal polyps are part of the tetrad. Let's take a look at the radiology. Here is our axial CT scan. Here is the nose. This is the nasal septum. And here is the maxillary sinus. Here, of course, is the nasal polyp. On pathology, the surface of the polyp is lined by respiratory epithelium, and the underlying stroma has a fibrous stroma with edema and mixed inflammation. You can see the respiratory lining right here, and here are the inflammatory cells. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed studying all these different lesions.